Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. I have Lorraine Garcia, a Certified Nurse Midwife um, that's in Nevada at the moment. She, um, she's she got wealth of knowledge. She's currently working on her PhD with a specialty in OB violence in the U.S. healthcare system. So we wanted to instantly hit record because we were talking about some great topics we wanted everybody to hear. So thanks, Lorraine, for joining me today. Hi, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. So if you want to start before we dive back into those topics, tell us a little bit about your midwifery journey, um, how you ended up where you are, what specialty you're currently in. So mine is, I'm a career change nurse for starters. So midwives ideally get brought into and intentionally are pursuing a midwifery philosophy and model of providing care. Mine has even more layers to it. I was a research specialist. I have my first master's is in sociology from the New School for Social Research in New York City. And my area of interest and my thesis and community work was on maternal mortality and specifically in New York City among Black women. And so I did a type of field ethnography where we were looking for root causes to that. Um, for better or for worse, um, some initiatives, it's improving. Others, I've looked at recent research because I am in a PhD program while I am still also practicing clinically. <laughs> I have one foot in both worlds. Um, some estimates as technology and research, uh, research has more tools to target certain things. There's a type of research now that's called geospatial research and they do it by zip codes. So you can target facilities more now. So that being said, in New York City, there are some facilities where the death rate for black birthing women is eight times greater than for white women. If you look at it collectively because of certain initiatives and yeah, midwives are part of it. Some are aggressive and improving yes, things. Yes, but we know that we are not systematically a solution to anything. There is no consistency in how midwives are available or accessible or integrated into care in the United States. So when they do the, the teams that are doing this geospatial targeted research, they find overall, yes, there is the, the, the data that represents performance and outcomes for New York City, but they can target that and they can geospatially say, there are these higher performing facilities that have these characteristics and these lower performing facilities that have these different characteristics. Yeah. Well, and there's certain states that it's like legally public knowledge, they have to promote their birth outcomes, their statistics, some states not. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, if it gets to that next level where you're just totally transparent, like if they want to talk about market competition, hokey peeps, like, hey, if you want a 10% C-section rate or you want electives in 45, like it's totally out there and transparent. Yep. Yeah. So one step there, keep on going. I was gonna get my PhD in sociology. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with New York City or specifically the New School for Social Research, there is no way I was going into six-figure debt to get an academic degree. Yeah. <laughs> I was not awarded the a PhD. The return on investment there. isn't the wisest choice. <laughs> no, and most of my contacts at that time in the late 90s in New York City, most of my contacts at that time, there were a lot of nurse run centers in New York City. So a lot of my research contacts, or they were people who had dual public health and nursing backgrounds. Those were a lot of people who on the ground were really looking for source information for why is this problem so persistent here? And how when we identify something that in my opinion, quite honestly, is a moral and an ethical failing, not only a clinical travesty. How is this not more of a priority? But yeah. it tends to get kicked down to advocacy level work. And there is no other specialty in all of medicine that could operate with that kind of disparity and individual practice patterns where, like you just said, a clinician is known 
to have a cesarean rate over 40%, a primary cesarean rate for low risk people, and another person has one that's seven to 9%, mm -hmm. there's no, I shouldn't say no, because different systems are doing different things. For example, right. Kaiser Permanente in California, and that whole region that Kaiser Permanente is strongly influences how that's done. But again, mm -hmm. midwives have been another significant solution to improving outcomes. But overall, you, you just can't find it. You can't have someone walk into the ER and present in a certain way and have a clinician decide, hmm, maybe I'll follow the stroke protocol today. Maybe I won't. Oh, yeah. sepsis? Hmm. What am I hungry? Am I tired? What am I in the mood to do yeah. right now? Maybe I'll yeah, follow the same protocol. I've got to get to a golf thing. I've got to be done at five. There's a bias. There's other pre. I mean, you, you probably know very, very well. I mean, C-section rates are the highest Monday through Friday, eight to five. Take out the electives, but there is. There's a personal influence that they've been up with this lady or managing her. They're a smaller practice. They want to go home for the weekend, especially Friday nights. Like there are very much biases, and when aggressive decision making of a um, uh, an easier path for delivery for the providers and it's quicker process sometimes. or an individual simply has a belief system where they do not value patient-centered care autonomy for birthing people and they have a belief system and a practice approach where they're mechanically and factory level style, just going to work their way through whoever is on the unit that day. Yeah. And they don't think they're doing a bad job. It's not there. These are people who believe they're doing a good job because eh, we they don't, don't know. see the direct, they don't see the direct complications a week later of the infection or the, I mean, they, they, they just see this and that's the goods and bads of these very, very big systems where you're so specialized in one piece of the system. Like I think midwives, especially full scope midwives doing private practices, they see the breastfeeding, they see the depression, they see the tenderness and the, the conflict, the challenges these women have from beginning to end, not just one piece of the puzzle. And I think sometimes that not so much empathy, but just realizing the impacts of long term, what decision you're making or, yeah. or pressuring one direction or the other. Yeah, yeah. And we could keep following that thread as I finish answering the story. So no PhD in sociology for sure. But for someone who does not come from a healthcare family, I come from a blue collar, no college, first time child in college background, wonderful life, but certainly not professional academic people and no healthcare providers, I didn't have a high opinion of nursing. I thought people who weren't smart enough, this was before the Johnson & Johnson nursing campaigns, this was before publicly, there was much more of a realistic face given to how nurses get to where they are, what pathways are available in nursing, who carries the brunt of the foundation of what needs to happen in patient care. And then I met all these people and I thought, oh my gosh, with my previous academic background, they had all those accelerated pathways to nursing by then. I thought I can do, I can do a BSN to MSN in two years. And I did, and I've never looked back. And as soon as I got really entrenched in providing clinical care, in addition to the other work that I do, oh, what a perfect match for someone like me. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I was thinking about, because I talked to so many amazing people across the country getting to the root causes, I've seen huge impacts with doula agencies creating nonprofits in certain cities mm -hmm. where they're doing it from as soon as they're pregnant to one year postpartum. So they're almost more like a female mentor than like what we're used to seeing for a doula. But when they when we can get to the education, the advocacy, because when they're in the moment in labor, I mean, there's so many pre the emotions are high. Like you, you mm -hmm. have to be able to have a point of contact consistently and build a relationship throughout the care, not just the, the day that because you don't know they're baseline education, it's not, yeah, they're not in at all a state to have a good informed consent or really go in deep on risk benefits at that point. And it's multi-level. It's, um, it's really helping me be more effective. Uh, <laughs> I'm not suggesting it as a way for anyone to, to dabble in if you're not really passionate about it, but I do, I love research. And 
Uh, the University of Colorado, where I go on the Anschutz Medical Campus, it's one of the very rare programs that has a healthcare systems specialty track. So when you look at something that is, the answers seem so apparent, which we see them all day, it's part of our belief system, the answer seems so apparent, and it's so frustrating and disheartening that the change doesn't follow. This isn't something where we're not capable, we don't have the resources, we don't know how to fix the problem. We know what the answers are, they don't get implemented. Mm -hmm. And it's because the system isn't designed to operate with a midwifery model of care. We right. all know from our own practice, it's well established in the research, the ideal solution to all of this is collaborative interdisciplinary care that is normalized among OB physicians and midwives. Mm -hmm. And women receive the benefit of individualized care within that. Mm -hmm. And the solution is there. This is yeah. a single specialty in healthcare that lives in direct opposition to what we know works best for birthing people and newborns. Well, and like you said, it's multifaceted because the insurance mm -hmm. companies are paying based on quantity <laughs> versus quality. The, yep. the midwives don't have a level of advocacy on the inside with legislature like physicians do. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of dynamics of, 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 of competition and business and um, who's, who's influencing the laws. Yeah. Like there's, there's, like you said, it's just, it's not just, oh, we know what to do, but you have to fix every single system <laughs> in the process to, yeah. tra to transition to that that mindset and shift. Yeah. we're trying to turn a massive ship that has just like you gave examples of so many moving parts and these are not small moving parts we are the only developed nation that has an, an almost pure for-profit healthcare model you're literally fighting against the the reward system, the reward in pure dollars and cents is what do I get paid for these services? Yeah, yeah. that's what drives what a lot of providers do. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's well known, like you were giving some of those examples of collective or integrated community models of care. That's all documented. These aren't things we just know because we care about it and we overlap with our own peers who who do things similarly to how we do and think similarly. Mm -hmm. to, they are also well established in the research base. Yeah. There's you could take there's just a lot of barriers in the backdrops the public doesn't even yep. see because I mean being a business consultant I talk to midwives all the time they'd love to do this in their state but then they can't they have to have a collaborating physician in, in writing or the reimbursement we couldn't make the financial projections work because the quality isn't getting valued by the insurance by the the cons like the preventative medicine is not our culture as a whole like we get pain we get I mean you know it with obesity and hypertension and um, we we are a culture that values proactive prevention we are like okay there's a problem yeah. now we're gonna fix it yeah. so we're phenomenal at technical medicine people who have the resources and the wealth to do so come here from around the world for our high level technical medicine out of all high resource nations we are the lowest performing high resource nation for health and wellness and that includes maternity care outcomes we have embarrassingly low rankings across the board in maternal and neonatal what we can do again with neonates and technical medicine is miraculous oh yeah but we can as, save the earliest yes. of babies but a normal healthy baby we we can't get good breastfeeding rates we, we have obesity too high like normal we're not good at here <laughs> no no we are not and then since I know sometimes what you, I could talk about so many things because this just is in this is the top of the list, this topic for my, my favorite things and the things that I care the most about. I think it's amazing. I'm excited to talk about this. So keep going. But I did, I came from, since a lot of your audience does want to know specifically, you know, about what's available in each state and different models for, for practice and simply legally, what are you able to do right. as a midwife? And even when we talk about midwives collectively, if you really are looking for 
full multi-level solutions for birthing people and for people who want access to midwifery care. We don't need, there's the certified nurse midwives, there's where certified midwives who take the same board certification exam that CNMs do, they're seriously prejudiced against in different hospitals. So you have these things going on for hospital-based care with CNMs and CMs. And then when you talk about really wanting to provide, you know, what are we, almost two years in to COVID, women who want out of hospital options. Yeah. And then you're, you're talking about what goes on with our CPMs. And in certain states and communities, what do we do with care and lay midwives, direct entry mm -hmm. lay midwives? Yeah. I am in, now that I have been in Nevada for six years, I am in the only state in the United States where home birth is entirely unregulated. Yeah. I could discard all of my credentials, leave hospital attended birth. Mm -hmm. And for a short while here in Nevada, I did have a dual model where I had a solo private midwifery practice and I offered out of hospital home birth mm -hmm. and I could do my own transfers of care as needed into one of the three hospitals where I have privileges and I have relationships with physicians. Most of my patients who needed to transfer to a hospital, not only was there continuity of care, most of them achieved a vaginal birth but they required interventions and support yeah, that are only available in a lot of augmentation. Just a little bit of help is a lot of times. Everybody thinks of the scary, scary transfers and those are so extremely yep. rare, so yeah. Yep, as are true obstetric emergencies, extremely, extremely rare. But those, that's very unique arrangement and that arrangement comes from how unique it is that I found my way here in Nevada to a practice where mm -hmm. we have a fully integrated group of a few female physicians and two CNMs who work together in complete collaboration. The, the other midwife and I, we work to the full scope of our midwifery practice. Oh. And yeah, a lot of women who want intentional midwifery care find their way to us. A lot of the women have no idea. I correct people all day long and tell them, Oh no, I'm Lorraine. I'm your midwife. That's why you like me so much because I'm your midwife. Yeah, yeah. Like, you get oh, called Dr. Doctor Garcia, and they Dr. put on Garcia. there all the doctors in the practice were great and they didn't even know most of the time they were seeing a midwife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't know that the reason you're having such a personalized, connected experience is because you're experiencing the midwifery model of care. But it wasn't, it's not intentional for a lot of people in Nevada because we're a very scarce presence here yeah. Yeah. and i don't find it to be a compliment to be called you know to be mistaken for a physician right. i'm always laughing and telling people no you're really enjoying yourself as much as a person can in labor and birth <laughs> and you're really having a connected holistic experience that that as much as possible meets whatever request you have whatever somebody yeah. prefers great as yeah. long as the labor is progressing well and the the birth is moving along in the right direction. I'll accommodate yeah. what anybody enjoys. You think you yeah. want to do some unusual little quirky thing? Great. Why not say yes more to birthing people than telling people these arbitrary, restrictive, no, you can't go to the toilet. No, you can't. We're like, we don't want the baby to be born in the toilet because that creates a big incident report in a hospital. But yeah. Let's try to get you to the toilet because this is not a birth center. Let's try to get you to the toilet. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll bring my things along just in case the baby's born on the way to or on the return from the toilet. But let's not try to do that. Yeah. Well, and I think when we talk about all these multifaceted barriers, there's another one you brought up, just the culture of society as a whole, educating more of midwifery, advocating for their options and choices because they think, well, I be I get pregnant, I call an obstetrician. And I had a great doula tell me a few years ago, it's like, we don't go to an orthodontist to get our teeth clean. So why do we go to an obstetrician high risk? Like there's another cultural thing that in our society, if they actually dug into it, like 
these are the specialists in low risk. These are the specialists in high risk. In other medical industries, we kind of have a good sense. We call our dentist to get our teeth clean, and now we've got some complex things going on. You go see the endontist. You go see the orthodontist. So, like, how did it happen in that profession where we, we've lost being the gateway, like a family practice and all these other medical, uh, yeah, so it's just interesting, all different directions. It is. It's a lot, and the history of it is so deep and diverse. And when you really try to pay honorable attention to, to what the history of midwifery is in the US, midwives collectively, uh, you know, certified nurse midwives were very white collectively, <laughs> were very mainstream collectively among ourselves, not that the system makes us mainstream. And then you follow the thread all the way back to what holistic midwifery was for most of time. Yeah. It's not as if when birth was taken from midwives and from women as the center of birth and moved into the hospital and taken over by a white male exclusive mm -hmm. model that was extremely abusive, extremely racist, mm -hmm. extremely prejudicial against the poor and immigrants and every layer of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. That yeah. system just kept going. It just kept building strength and digging in and getting bigger and stronger and dominating the birth system in the United States. And now people are, you know, sure it's a problem. It's a huge problem, but at every level, community groups, doula organizations, different levels of midwives, nurses, relationships between nurses and midwives, all of that, attorneys who work in birth justice and reproductive justice, yes. the handful of rare attorneys who will take obstetric violence cases. You know, no, you didn't have to nearly kill or permanently physically injure somebody. You, you violated informed consent. You violated the, the Bill of Patients Rights. You coerced or forced a person into an unnecessary surgery. You, you caused great harm. The idea that you can just look at a physiologically stable new parent and newborn and say, okay, everybody's fine. We did a good job. Yeah, safe mom, safe baby. What are you, what are you complaining about is the cultural norm attitude. And it's, yeah. it's just so discriminating. I had a discussion last week with one of the co-owners of Gyne Zone because they do a lot with online education for suturing and childbirth, uh, just the water birth and the prevention of tears and talking like they made huge momentum in Europe the last 10 years because they could relate it like, okay, if this was your penis and all of a sudden it got mutilated, wouldn't you want the best of the best? So like somehow it, like to get the, the mainstream system that's in higher administration to relate like that feministic approach like they they don't have this this anatomy and they can't relate to all the complications and the the challenges of not yeah. having a proper laceration so yeah it would, so we got to figure out different creative ways of the u.s to get momentum happening and advocacy and reproductive justice groups they can just boldly say what needs to be said they don't they don't need to necessarily tread both sides of the line or be as as neutral as sometimes you have to be when you're trying to you're consider employed all, and you got to worry about having a job next week mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. the stakeholders i mean mm -hmm. separate from people's employment where where certain choices we make if we're violating a hospital policy that's where our medical staff privileges come from i i'm very upfront with patients about that I can do everything within the range of my skills and meeting your preferences. What I can't do is violate hospital policy. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's the limit for me when I'm attending women in hospital. Yeah. When I'm attending women out of hospital, which really is my preferred setting, yeah. then my only limitation is, and not as the fake, I'm gonna use the word safety to, to coerce you, or I'm gonna use the word safety to assume control over you yeah the literal meaning of my job as <laughs> as yeah. being responsible for the safety of the mother and the unborn baby at that time or the newborn that's yeah. that's my limitation when i'm doing out of hospital birth when you're yeah. in a hospital the honest answer to birthing people is 
no, if that's what you really want, I'm, I need to tell you, the hospital won't allow you to do that. That's not a question of, do I do that as a midwife? There is no water birth in hospital in the state of Nevada. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. There's been hospitals that have had it over time. One hospital, there was a slip and fall with a nurse. There went all the tubs, boom, gone. A different hospital, I don't know exactly what was going on, but I knew, I know the timing. Uh, there was, it was actually a physician because the hospital wrote a policy where midwives can't attend water births, but physicians can. So <laughs> put that into backwards world. <laughs> yeah. One physician here who is very active um, doing things that are not typical, let's just say for, for OB physician care, he was doing, he was attending water births like crazy there. He left town for two weeks. The pediatricians all got together. And when he came back, there was no more water birth. Oh my God. At least that's the way the story is told. I wasn't right. practicing here in Nevada yet right. when that happened. Yeah. But yeah. consistently, that is the way the story is told. <laughs> yeah. And those are those, all those dynamics. I mean, this is when you're the minority, like even private practices for OBs that are trying to give more personalized, they're ostracized from their colleagues that are doing the bigger systems. And like, so there's so many dynamics of pushing every direction to try to make more of an assembly line, which is the last thing you want for maternity care. <laughs> yeah. And that is like you were saying in that example, when you look at the big picture and we're not specifically just looking at ourselves and talking about our midwifery issues and we really look at 360 degrees, who are our interdisciplinary colleagues and what are the limitations and the barriers that they're working in? For collaborating I don't with know us the, and creating good safety. Yeah, I don't know the exact statistic, but nationwide, the last time I heard a number attached to it, more than half, I think it was 53% at that time, and quite honestly, it's probably just increased, more than 53% of physicians are corporate employed now. Mm -hmm. They answer to the corporations that employ them, and mm -hmm. that's not working for physicians either. They are certainly not the enemy. Anybody who you do want, and sometimes they're part of the problem, but they're definitely not the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> and when you need physician level care for somebody, you want the most reliable, skilled, compassionate physician you can find. And a lot of midwives live and practice in areas where it's very hostile. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced that because my midwifery origin is New Jersey and New York City. Midwives mm -hmm. have relative in the United States. It's still not anything that exists as a given or part of normalized care, but midwifery has pretty strong presence in New Jersey and New York. And mm -hmm. I was trained in, in a system where midwives are integrated into the hospital-based care. And I did dual training when I did my midwifery training. So I trained in home. I was a CNM who did train in home birth and hosp hospital based care. So I had both extremes going from the time that I was a training midwife. And I know that that's not common to, no. I know now that I've been out practicing as a much more senior experienced person. Usually a midwife will receive one or the other of those things. And then it gets even harder for us to put the pieces together across the entire spectrum. Yeah, you and I have a very similar as well. I had three home births. I had my own private home birth birth center practice till 2017, hence why starting this consulting service, because the business side is not what we're trained. Um, and then I did my clinicals where I got the best of both worlds. I got some hospital and did as a nurse high risk, and but also had Amish Mennonite birth center home births for six months. So like, I, yeah. I, but, and that's another barrier. Like we're talking about all these multifaceted barriers, clinical opportunities. I mean, CPMs only see one side, licensed midwives, direct entry. They, they know home birth physiological birth very 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 well mm -hmm. cnms rarely get to see or even labor and delivery nurses or the hospital systems mm -hmm. we've lost i mean even like the retiring nurses when they talk about oh, when it used to all be intermittent monitoring and labor support and the 90s with epidurals and adding like when these interventions started all coming in you're losing this lost art of even the staff supporting the women are fearing birth they're fearing the culture so like 
you said, there's just so many multifaceted and how do you chip away one at a time and they're all interconnected. <laughs> yeah. And you try not to get overwhelmed by it because everything that we do from, from the most micro level to where it is just the midwife and the person whom she's providing care to, that matters. Every single one of those encounters matter. You're truly impacting a person's whole reproductive childbirth and the, the dyad, the, the, the initial connections between the birthing person and the newborn. You, you're influencing that. And then you just, depending on, we only all have the bandwidth to do what we can do. Yeah. <laughs> but depending on, you know, a lot of midwives are exceptional people. And because we are not the norm, we're always pushing the boulder up the hill a bit. Every time we're working and just existing in the US, if you're truly following the midwifery model of care, you are automatically working against a system that is not that. Yeah. And that makes midwives unique because it it inflames us, it pushes our buttons, you know, it drives our passion that will wait. I can look into at the very least, you start looking into the staff regulations. Well, wait a minute, what's my delineation of privileges? If you are a facility employed or have privileges, independent privileges at a hospital, that's a learning process. I've mm -hmm. talked to new midwives who don't know what their delineation of privileges are or what it means at the very least. They may know they have a DOP document somewhere that was part of their package for when they yeah. got their They just privileges. do what they were told on orientation, but they actually don't know, like if you go to court, yeah, this midwife's telling you to do something, but she's actually not following. Like you, like I think sometimes we forget what's the true source because I hear it all the time with midwives. Well, she does it at this practice down the road, so it's okay. And I'm like, but maybe she's violating, like we need the regulations, the rules, the backdrop stuff that that's your point yep. of defense, not what the other midwife is doing. So yeah, it's, it's a learning curve for sure. And what does your state license say? When you look up whatever level of midwife you are within the state where you practice, if it's a state where the overwhelming majority license different levels of midwives and CNMs for sure, what does that licensing say? And then you start to, if you are inclined, you start to look at, hmm, why aren't we having same pay for same services in most states? How come I get paid and then pick a state? You know, why do I get paid 70% of what a, a physician gets paid? 85%, 100%. You got to know to fill out this application to get 100% because you're private. Like, yeah, why is it not consistent um, among our professions? Physicians would mm -hmm. never have to deal with those extra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there is a hospital of the three different hospitals where I have privileges here in Nevada. They have made literally the handful of midwives, I think there's maybe three of us that go there now at most, there's five, and one is my own partner. So two out of three or two out of five of us are coming from the same place. We are ghost practitioners. Every single thing we do has to be physician co-signed. When that hospital runs our quality review or our performance review. Your stats are lost, your outcomes are lost, your, your they're, values They're non-existent. Lost. They just come right out and tell us send us all your face sheets or how you track yourself and we'll use that. I'm like, so you created a system where we're invisible, but you still need to review our performance. Yeah. And I have to you do made us invisible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's how it's very difficult to make change. I know a lot of midwife directors get into billing and showing the value and showing mm -hmm. like, okay, where, what are we saving and costs? It's very difficult when the reports don't accurately cover the procedures being done or the services being rendered by the midwives. It's all lost under the physician's rendering service agreements. Yeah. And if a person, you know, is either just getting started as a newer practicing midwife, or it's just not where somebody's mind goes and they typically don't think about those kinds of things, you can just ratchet it up to the big macro level stuff. And when they do look at changes in legislation, we're not represented in the data. When, when advocates and lobbyists are advocating for legislative change, they need to rely on data. 
And if we're not present in there, you know, use the words like value, because we do increase value also, we improve quality of mm -hmm. care, we improve patient satisfaction. Things that are Every a little bit difficult to tracked. put in a number data collection. Yeah, with breastfeeding yeah. and the, now this kid didn't have a NICU visit because of X, Y, Z, like you just, it's a mm -hmm. lot harder, to, it's a little more subjective estimates versus just this outcome happened because of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so facility, facility-based, data is often inaccurate depending on how a clerk fills out a birth certificate how they're trained to fill out a birth all this stuff matters yeah <laughs> when you're talking about the the business and the big picture practice stuff and i know yeah. that that's one of the things i enjoy when i learned about you and what you do and i took oh, a good look you. into it it made me feel really excited because like i say there are these very big problems that we're all pushing back against but there are so many people at so many different levels doing really good work and yeah. like i said trying to turn that massive ship but we're all so many of us are doing our part and we're like let's go you got yeah. it <laughs> This well, and that's where right. it's really like, I'm a big like, okay, everything's so interconnected, but what can I do as one person that'll have the biggest ripple effect? And I was like, mm -hmm. I want more private practices. I want more, not just private practices, but long-term sustainable legacy, not burning out, like really mm -hmm. good successful practices. And the big yeah. Achilles to that was business education, was entrepreneurship, like midwives, we love catching babies, but we aren't very good at running private practices unless you have some a good mentor or you have some backdrop unique connection um, we just kind of do it on the fly and so that's why i started my company in 2017 because there was such a i loved catching babies we had amazing outcomes but i wasn't a good business owner and so i needed to change that with training and um take going down this other rabbit hole to help out other midwives so yeah we, de we need more i think that's the biggest thing is we need more of midwives practicing on their terms but also having a good work-life balance and being able to um, make a big impact in their communities yeah and the the sustainability of that over the long term and one of the things that um I'm really mindful of and will always bring up in a discussion where it's relevant is we need midwives practicing the midwifery model of care. We don't need midwives inserted into care gaps who get crushed Triage into a, into like a biomedical assistant. machine. We need midwives doing what we're best at and what serves birthing people and newborns best, which is yeah. practicing the midwifery model of care. And, you know, of course, I can't help myself. Um, all these things that we know from what we do and what we see and what we experience, we know them because they, they're they true. It's the same thing though, what drives policy change, what drives legislative change, what drives reimbursement change, all those other things that we talked about. It's really starting to gain it's always been present in the literature, in the research literature, but it's really starting to gain momentum. You know, you use that, what I think is a very offensive term, healthy mom, healthy baby, everything's fine. My area of research that you mentioned when you introduced me is obstetric violence. And obstetric violence in a high resource country like the United States, that's not the severe, blatant physical abuses you see in low resource countries. It's much more normalized into return uh, into routine care. And Absolutely. so it takes a different approach. These aren't individual people at an individual level. I'm going to put a woman in restraints and if she's noisy, Dream slap her in the face. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is it's embedded into normalized care. There is a lot of coercion, there's a lot of force, there's a lot of medically unnecessary, invasive, traumatizing procedures that happen that are totally unnecessary. Yeah. And it causes a whole cascade of known and recognized harms. You know, the number of birthing people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, women who do have ongoing physical pain or physical injuries, disrupted newborn bonding, mm -hmm. unnecessary morbidity and mortality. I mean, it just follows. There's a, I was really excited because a lot of this is a little more recent. It's a 2020 publication 
And the title is called, At Least Your Baby is Healthy, Obstetric Violence or Disrespect and Abuse in Childbirth Occurrence. And these people, I always wanna make sure I give people the right credit. The primary author is from Massachusetts General here in Boston. Wow. And that's Violet Parati. And this one is just a big, uh, it's a literature review. But for the first time, probably since 2019, 2020, literally, like my first concept analysis on obstetric violence has a publication date of 2020. It was accepted in 2019, but specifically, I did the research and had a concept analysis on obstetric violence in the United States mm -hmm. completed, and it was accepted by Nursing Forum, because what we don't have here in the U.S., we have people who have been very active since, sometimes since the early 2000s in other nations, middle resource and low resource nations, who have really been dedicating a, a lot of work and legislative effort into codifying, like strangely enough, obstetric violence is codified into law in Mexico and a few Central American and South American nations. That's where it's codified into law and where it's talked about by legal scholars and attorneys who do deal with reproductive justice uh, and obstetric violence issues is putting it in subsections of protections for violence against women. So it really, I mean, these things are all happening, but there's some of the best midwives I know have never even heard in the United States, have never even heard of the concept of calling this, collectively calling this obstetric violence. And it's, it's really interesting because there's a lot of momentum behind some things that have the potential to make a significant difference. But what yeah. we're pushing yeah. back against in the US is so yeah. multi layered. Well, and it becomes and the so minority. Huge. I mean, even the few that are pushing back because it's not the norm, they're ostracized from that facility or ostracized. Like you're almost punished as a healthcare practitioner when you're going against the grain. You know morally your beliefs, your ethics, and what should be done, and you're advocating mm -hmm. for it. And I mean, I could think of dozens of times where I've got yelled at in the hallway later or got lectures and disciplines and laughing during evaluations because I'm like, can I record this? Because this is like, you're telling me not to do delayed cord clamping because peds don't want it and you're openly telling me it's evidence-based like you 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 when you're against the grain of something that's a bigger society sometimes you do you feel like this weight of like can i really make a big impact but i think it's more yeah. and more people shifting and advocating it is and then the the science is there the science catches up but most clinicians at every level rns midwives and physicians things that physicians claim are evidence-based, oh, yeah. particularly in childbirth, are often completely contrary to what the evidence base is. But then science catches up. But that doesn't mean that that information trickles down and is disseminated into practice. I overlap with OB-GYN residents at two out of three of the hospitals where I attend births. When they say things, they want to learn their, you know, that's a unique path. That's not our pathway. We don't take a physician pathway. We didn't choose a physician pathway. We took a nursing and midwifery pathway. But when that delayed cord clamping issue comes up, I say no, because I do have one foot in both worlds. Unlike the most fascinating research there is now, and delayed cord clamping was defined, I can't think of her name, which I am very sorry to the research team who did this work that I can't think of the primary person's name, <laughs> but they defined delayed cord clamping as five minutes. Yeah, not and one they, minute and waiting till the warmer APGAR goes off. Yes. Or 30 <laughs> seconds. And it's mm -hmm. not an arbitrary time anyway. It's when the utero the placental blood volume the baby doesn't has need finished it anymore, infusing yeah. into the newborn. <laughs> Yeah. But the point being, they followed these newborns. This was an extremely rigorous study. They followed those newborns for 18 months of life. And they had increased white matter, increased iron stores, increased nerve myelinization. myelinization. The, the statistically significant difference between the newborns who received delayed cord clamping defined as five minutes. <laughs> 
Not compared to the control <laughs> group that's stumbling to find your ear, your scissors. Yep. <laughs> so I may be a, a, a more rare midwife for who crosses paths with me interdisciplinarily when I'm out working, because if you're going to just repeat things that are routinized wrongs and just people sharing incorrect information among each other and it just reinforces the same harmful practices i happen to live in both worlds where i can usually tell you no this is not only is this fascinating but this supports what midwives have done all along and now we have this science to prove it also and the very rare cases where a baby develops hyperbilly rubinemia from delayed cord clamping there's not even a consistent statistically significant association between those things sometimes yeah. it pops up in the results but overwhelmingly what you see yeah are do you do an intervention that it caused complications like yeah, yeah because it hit the low end of that threshold and got labeled that but did it really cause a poor outcome did it yeah it, mm -hmm. it's it's a muddied water yeah where there are these things that are just overwhelmingly significant and mind-boggling you're truly talking about to the the best evidence is to do if it's not catastrophic neonatal resuscitation the best evidence is to have a portable table and do your neonatal resuscitation with a newborn who is still connected to the placenta yep yeah i keep Bring waiting your for business. nrp guidelines to really yeah. start pushing that hard yeah i keep waiting for it <laughs> Yeah, would you actually like this neonate to have its blood volume so that All it sudden can we cut off its lifeline? You can't get it breathing, but now we cut off the little ounce of oxygen it's getting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's hypotensive and it's hypotensive because you literally took it, its blood volume away. Yeah, yeah. So, well, Lorraine, I could honestly talk to you for hours and hours, and I try to keep these um, videos 20, 30 minutes just because people um, get it down a rabbit hole. But I would love to chat with you again. We can do something again in two, three months and go down another topic because I think people are really going to enjoy this interview. You're a wealth of knowledge. So, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Yes, I'd be happy to return at any time. And if anybody is ever interested, I will just tag this on to the end because. I kind of think my our initial um, talk has a theme. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just want to say the first names for anyone who is interested in in the research that supports what we know works. I'll just say the lead authors. Same thing. Most of these dates are like 2019, 2020 yeah. publication dates, and it specifically looks at the influence of midwifery presence and outcomes. So all these titles and these four recent articles on the influence of midwifery presence in hospitals and outcomes midwifery presence and cesarean birth utilization in u.s centers with and without midwives that's um denise smith denise c smith she's actually from my university of colorado uh nicole carlson does that work Jeremy Neal is primary on some of that work, and E A L Jeremy Neal. And what is Lisbeth's last name? That's Lunsberg. She looks at um, variation in hospital and intrapartum practices where people's routines affect cesarean rates. I like to do this. I like to do this. Well, maybe you're hurting people and causing unnecessary My surgical births. Level. I've done this for years and I don't want to learn anything new. Like, yeah, teaching the old dog new tricks attitude. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember where the baby comes out if you turn around. What is this? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So yes, I am so glad you sent out that notice. And if you have any um, topics that you like that you think I fit or yeah you just well and I'm saying I, I like to get round? more engagement with the channel I'm asking everybody put in the comments like if they loved this interview please put down what you would love us to chat about next time and yeah I I, I really my whole point is like I, I love all these things but if that's not what people are looking for we gotta I would love to get some feedback and engagement from people so thank you so much for your time today Lorraine you're very welcome it was wonderful to meet you and I was really happy to do this thank you